Hey everybody, I'm Greg Soule and this is Why Am I, a podcast where I get to talk to interesting people and try and trace a path to where they find themselves today. My guest this go around is Caleb Boylai from Boylai Hobby Time. First, this dude stays busy. I think I've been chasing him for probably the better part of a year, but as they say, persistence pays off. Or stocking, light stocking. I mean, it wasn't full blown stocking. Anyway, Caleb is a wildly successful YouTuber who expertly builds dioramas from everything from, say, Star Wars to fantastical Weird West scenes. It's his fascinating builds that bring you to the channel, right, for the first time, but it's his calm voice his wry sense of humor and uh, mesmerizing build process that keeps you coming back. Uh, The shy artist has lived his life in Denver, Mongolia, California, Thailand, uh, which gives him a unique perspective and uh, I think a drive to explore our country, you know, you know, like the way few others probably possess. But I, I think likely we all could probably benefit from a little bit of this curiosity. So please share with a friend if uh, you enjoy it, help us grow. And I hope you enjoy this chat with Caleb. Caleb, uh, well, let me say your whole name, Caleb Boylai. Thank you for joining me on the Why Am I podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Did I, did I nail it? I've heard you say it a uh, hundred thousand times, I think. Yeah, yes, that is correct. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So you and I, I feel like... Uh, you're a Denver guy, so uh, I've been there a, a couple of times. I really liked going, just walking around. I'm like a, I don't know, I'm just kind of like a, I like cities. I like navigating around, and we happen to uh, be next to each other. Perhaps we're outside of, I find myself outside of the hobby shop, and uh, maybe it's a little early and they're not open, and so we're killing time and talking. And, uh, you know, we talk about me for a second, and I am super boring. I'm sure you can already tell. Uh, we quickly exhaust that, and it's your turn to reciprocate, so... Caleb, who are you? Who am I? Mm. Well, let's see. We can start with uh, where I was born. Uh, I was born in Denver, Colorado. (coughs) Sorry, I still have a little bit of a cough. Uh, Born in Denver, Colorado. And um, was here uh, until I was six years old. Then my family moved overseas. We moved to the country of Mongolia, where I spent the next 12 years. Uh, They went there as missionaries. Uh, My dad directed a school for international kids. And um, yeah, kind of grew up there doing all the normal things that a kid would do uh, just in Mongolia. Uh, Came back to the States after I graduated high school and uh, was going to go to college. I started college and uh, was thinking of going into uh, an art degree of some kind. Um, Art restoration really intrigued me. Um, Art history uh, and then actually doing studio art, all stuff that I (coughs) had an interest in and uh, enjoyment of. But uh, after doing some general eds, um, I just felt like I was doing high school all over again. <laughs> so I uh, I was like, you know what? I think I could probably do <coughs> art in my free time. I, I think I can still try and chip away at some artwork and then also instead of being in school, go uh, start working. So... Um, before doing that, I, I went to a little um, a kind of a discipleship uh, Bible school thing uh, in northern Colorado. And then I went over to uh, Thailand, where my parents had moved to after being in Mongolia. And they, um, they switched kind of roles over there, and I went to hang out with them for a little while. I taught some English uh, down south in Thailand, and then my visa was about to expire. I needed to come back to the United States um, because my visa in Thailand was expiring. And um, I could have chosen to stay in Mongolia, or sorry, in Thailand, uh, and renewed the visa. But uh, right at that time, my uncle was moving to uh, (coughs) back to Denver from um, 
the other side of the country and he was opening a coffee roastery. So I, um, I started working for him and, uh, it was my, uh, I, I was originally just going to be delivering coffee, um, and helping him roast the coffee. But, uh, the city of Lakewood required that we have, uh, which is where he opened up his coffee shop and roastery required that there be some, uh, uh, form of retail on site. So he, he put me in charge of that. And so for two years I ran, um, the coffee shop, uh, and the little, I, I prepared all the coffee for people that uh, was served there. Uh, fast forward, uh, to the end of my time there, I moved to California where, uh, my fiance was and, uh, we got married. Uh, we got married over in Thailand actually. And then we <laughs> came back to California. We, we thought we were going to do something, uh, else and, uh, ended up going a different direction. Uh, we started our own business, did that. And then COVID started mm. and that's when I got into YouTube. Uh, I, I had actually started the YouTube, YouTube channel, uh, just before COVID, um, because my uh, doing our, doing my job, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, um, doing the job had kind of depleted me of, uh, creative outlets. I, I used to do a lot of creative things like photography and, uh, art and music and all of that kind of stuff. And, uh, found myself working way too much. So I started the YouTube channel to kind of force myself, hmm. um, to do a little bit of get back into the creative game, uh, get back into, um, yeah expressing myself with art and, uh, the YouTube channel it, it was basically, um, a form of accountability. Mm. Uh, I was going to share it with my friends and family and they were, I knew that they were going to be watching it. And so I wanted to have, uh, you know, I wanted people to ask me like, Oh, are you going to put another video out? You know, are, are you going <laughs> to create something else? Are you going to do this? Uh, I never really, mm, considered that it would, um, grow as much as it has. Uh, so I started making videos and, um, during COVID lockdowns, I decided that I was going to release one video a week until the COVID lockdown, um, ended. And I just kept doing it. And it's been three years since then. And now I try to put out a video once a week. Um, sometimes I don't, um, just based on my schedule, but yeah, that's, mm. uh, that's childhood birth to now, I guess. <laughs> that's a pretty, that's a pretty interesting journey. So if, how often are you, how often are you meeting new people and they, you know, say, Hey, where are you from? And you have to explain, well, from Colorado <laughs> to Mongolia, to Colorado, to California, to Thailand. To, it's like, is that, uh, do people look at you like you're a little bit crazy? It, I typically don't, uh, open with that. <laughs> <laughs> I try to, I try to ask more questions, uh, um, about them, uh, when I meet people. So, uh, you are know, you, are you somewhat uncomfortable talking about yourself in general? I don't prefer it. Um, I, <laughs> it's not, yeah, not my go-to um, topic of conversation. Hmm. I'll typically, so, oh yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I typically like to, um, I try not to ask uh, questions that, uh, you know, like when um, <coughs> somebody comes into my place of work and, I say, oh, do you have any fun plans for the weekend? You know, like often people reciprocate the question and, um, you know, I, I don't typically have much that I'm doing on the weekend. So it's nice to be able to answer like, no, I, you know, I wasn't asking so that you would ask me about my weekend so I could tell you about my weekend. <laughs> you know, I genuinely wanted to know about your weekend and, uh, yeah, I tried to, try to steer around questions that would, um, prompt them to ask about me. I, I, um, yeah, I don't know. 
I don't, I don't typically like to uh, talk about me. Hmm. Are you, are you genuinely a curious person when it comes to other people? Like you are uh, actually like pretty interested in, uh, yeah, where they yeah, came absolutely. From um, and in, in, in working in coffee, the, you know, it's, it's a, it's an important skill to learn, um, to be interested in customers and, uh, to be interested in people as they come in and, you know, ask them uh, about themselves and remember things about them uh, hmm. so that when they come back, you can, you can remember, even if you don't remember their name, you remember, <coughs> you remember details. Um, and that really does help. Uh, it connects with people. People re really enjoy that. Um, and I've tried to do that with my, uh, interactions like one-on-one -on -one with people who connect with me um, because of YouTube um, when uh, I get written to by you know someone who, who um, wants to show me what they've made that that was inspired by a video of mine you know I I try to stick around in the, <coughs> in those um, messages and uh, interact with those people and um, I can't, I can't obviously reach out to and connect personally with everyone, but, um, there are definitely, definitely individuals who have written who I have tried to, um, I don't know if it's, I've felt like I needed to, uh, be their friend. Hmm. That's interesting. So do you feel like you put this pressure on yourself like regularly to like, ah, I need to not just interact to like boost the algorithm, but to actually like make these connections with people? Um, I mean, I don't think, I don't think I've put necessarily pressure on myself to do it. It's kind of a natural thing. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't respond to many of the comments on my videos. Um, I, that it would probably just take up way too much of my time. I was going through and, and, and felt the need to uh, respond to every comment there. But um, when people take the time to write me an email or a direct message, um, then I, I do feel a little bit more obligation. But I, I do also enjoy um, responding to, um, to as many as possible. Hmm. I'm... I'm assuming you never anticipated having um, people, I would say, probably look up to you, right? Or, or I mean, you said draw inspiration, but really see you as kind of a, a role model in, in a certain respect, I guess. Was that, was that, I mean, one, I can't assume you anticipated that. And is that kind of weird for you still? Yeah, yeah, it is, it is weird, um, especially for something like making dioramas. You know, I, <laughs> <laughs> I am... I'm aware of how funny that actually is. Um, I, you know, like <laughs> I play with miniatures and models. Um, and I post a video about it online and it's, it is kind of ridiculous how, how many people that has the potential to reach. You know, somebody, um, somebody told me one time is that um, they were, they were talking about podcasts, but I've sort of expanded this to like sort of, exist in, in, in many spheres as they said like people will find you know your content uh, based on like specific subject matter right like they're looking for a diorama or like the podcast they're looking for like an interview of a specific person right but they said right. that they stay because of your personality right so they find you for a reason hmm. but then they stay and I have uh, since I found you like, a pretty good while back like you have just steadily grown and grown and grown and um, you ever thought about what that, uh, what that says about you and just kind of the, um, I don't know, you're always, just, I don't know, you seem very soft-spoken, very polite, uh, very engaged. And I, I like the, uh, I like the wryness of your, your humor as well. It, uh, <laughs> it always, it always pulls me in because you almost say some of your jokes, like it's just commonplace, like they aren't jokes. And so if you're not looking for them, sometimes they fly by you. I love that. Like, <laughs> did you ever anticipate people to like, kind of like fall in love with, uh, like just you, I guess? Uh, not really. Um, <laughs> I, I don't have, I, I never really felt like I had the, um, the type of our personality that would, um, 
I do well on on YouTube. I'm not, you know, I'm not very high energy. Uh, <coughs> I'm a pretty pretty low key person um, to begin with, and um, you know, my jokes are a little bit more subtle. I'm a little bit more deadpan, um, which is just kind of my my sense of humor, I guess. But uh, yeah, no, I I I'm surprised that um well one people say that they enjoy listening to me talk <laughs> that's surprising to me it's very soothing so so that's funny i think yeah and i'm surprised that people um i'm like the stuff i'm building it makes a little more sense because i i started with star wars and i I'm, i wasn't surprised that the star wars fans were mm. you know enjoyed watching that stuff um and then the wild west stuff that I have done, you know, it's kind of, kind of gained a little bit of a, a, a cult following, uh, people who are invested in the, in the thing. But, and, and so I'm, I'm not, I'm not that surprised, um, that people are latch on to those things, but it is funny to me that people, uh, and, and it is unusual, I guess, still to think about, um, that people enjoy watching for, uh, for my, for my commentary. Have you ever thought of yourself as famous? I'm curious about that. Um, I mean, not really. I think I, the, I, I still have some level of anonymity. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't put my person, I don't put my face on there and I'm mm -hmm. not like, you know, like the, the real goal is for the, the stuff I'm building and the process and the creative, the creative process to be the character, I guess. Um, so me personally, I don't, I don't think I am a fan. I, I don't think I'm famous. I don't s really think about it like that. Um, and in the, you know, in, in the, in the grand scheme of things, um, you know, I'm not a Mr. Beast or any of those kind of personalities. So, I mean, going into a hobby store and then maybe somebody recognizing me is a little bit interesting, but I'm also in a hobby store as a very specific, um, niche. Target rich environment. Is that? Yeah, maybe the exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, uh, you know, it's not like if I go into the mall and, you know, start talking, people recognize my voice, you know, it's a very specific places where I have been recognized a few times, uh, for my voice, uh, which is weird to me. It's very unique. It's 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 not as as weird as you may think. So I used to uh, I used to do stuff in this very weird narrow niche of technology, and I did a ton of training materials. And then I would go to this conference that was about that, and people would hear me talk, and they would turn around and they'd be like, "Hey, you're Greg, right?" And it was so <laughs> weird, like the description of parasocial relationship. These people had been listening to me. Uh, it, you know, through the educational stuff and then the podcast that they knew me, right? Cause yeah. you slowly let out details about yourself, you know, like where right. you're from, the things you like and, you know, stuff you did maybe last week. And so these people, they know you, they know you super well hmm. and they're entire strangers to you. So that's, um, it's definitely, it's definitely weird. Is that, uh, is that kind of your, like, what's your uh, impression? Do you think it's pretty cool when people are like, oh my gosh, can I get your autograph? Or they, I assume <laughs> they would say, can I get a selfie? Isn't that the new version of, can I get an autograph? Um, <clears throat> yeah, it is, it is weird. Um, I, I pretty much tell, I, I, I tell most people like, yeah, I prefer not to be in a photo or anything, you know, um, and it, and it hasn't, it honestly hasn't happened that often. I mean, I, I can look at the analytics on my, on my channel and I see that, um, in Denver, oh, you know, I think there's only like, I think there's maybe 15,000 people who regularly watch from Denver. So, you know, spread out across the whole population of Denver, that's a, it's a pretty small, small number of people. So the chance that I'll run into those people is pretty, um, minimal. It goes up when I go to a hobby store, obviously. I but, was going to um, say that's still an incredible number. So I, I'm willing to bet a good portion of those people probably end up in a hobby store. 
<laughs> yeah, it's, it's probably true. Mm, that's fun. So I've noticed the no face thing. Um, you're not the only one that does it. There's most other crafters. I'm trying to think of other than like Bill making stuff. I don't know any other crafters that actually <laughs> put their faces on camera. So it's not, it's definitely not a unique thing. Do you think that's, uh, do you think that, uh, what is it? Chicken or egg, right? Is it you, uh, crave anonymity so you just do dioramas or uh doing dioramas makes you want anonymity why do you think that is such a, a thread amongst you cats that's a good question actually um in in my very very first video i um there's a few <coughs> <coughs> there's a few shots where you can see kind of some of the side side profile of my face and um you know like you know, I I was in in the in the video. I wasn't the main focus of it, but uh, as I continued, I just kind of like I didn't necessarily watch many crafting channels when I first started. Mm. I watched some Warhammer videos, and most of them were in their are in their videos, like Warhammer channels, uh, war gaming. Most of those are personalities. Um, they're not, mm. you know, the but um, so I don't. I don't know why I decided to just kind of keep my face out of it, but um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think it's a little different for everyone. Like, uh, I don't know. You know, I haven't talked to some of the other craft people about why or why they don't put their um, themselves on camera. For me, it was just kind of, uh, I don't know, kind of a natural thing. I didn't really think much about it. I, cause, you know, I, I, when I first started, I didn't really feel like <coughs> I had much of a uh, personality or, or pre like I, I don't know if I would even at this moment do well on camera. Like I don't, uh, I think it would be a learning curve for me to actually mm. feel comfortable talking to a camera. And it was just a lot easier for me to just record the voiceover afterwards. I just made more sense, more sense for my personality. Um, I, I script most of my videos. I try to make it sound like it's not super, super scripted, but, um, I do script everything. And so I think being on camera, just, um, just the, the kind of having a stage presence or whatever, uh, it didn't feel that natural to me. So it just kind of made more sense for my personality to just have the voice. Hmm. You gotta, you gotta build up to it, right? Like make it, um, subscription incentive. <laughs> <laughs> like once there you hit go. 5 million subscribers, you'll, you'll do face reveal or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> Give the people what they want, Caleb. Come That's on. right. Yeah. There you are. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. I, so would you say you're just kind of a little bit more shy, maybe a little more reserved? Yeah, I would say so. I'm, I'm a little more shy. Uh, yeah, I, I was definitely um, growing up. I was, uh, I don't know. I wouldn't say shy. I was uh, had so much anxiety like around people. It wasn't mm. even like I felt like necessarily shy. I was just, I was always anxious. And so it took me uh, a lot of time, a lot of work to kind of grow out of that stuff. But mm. I, I definitely still feel i think shy in a lot of scenarios um some like this i can pretend like it's just you and me so it makes it easier for me yeah that's right <laughs> uh as opposed to knowing that i've got fifteen thousand people in my town watching this that's that's a different level of uh discomfort <laughs> i think i would suffer so i hmm. totally get it All right man would you you gave me an amazing description of yourself and your childhood you were talking about moving to Mongolia at six. Do you remember the, like the, it had to be culture shock. I mean, I don't know any other way of describing it. Do you remember that time kind of? No, yeah, absolutely. Like? I do. Um, it's funny. My brothers and I all have pretty good memories, like long-term memories, not necessarily mm. good short-term memories, but uh, yeah, we have good long-term memory. And so I, I very, very distinctly remember moving to Mongolia. Um, and the probably my biggest disappointment was um, one of my favorite things in the whole world was running around outside without shoes on in the grass. Hmm. And, uh, when we got to Mongolia, 
uh, there just wasn't any grass and we, hmm. we couldn't go outside without our shoes on cause, um, it was mostly gravel and there was a lot of broken glass. So yeah, I, I remember six year old me was pretty disappointed that, um, you know, and we had, j- we got there in September. So, um, we had just come, f- come from a beautiful Colorado summer, uh, nice green grass and we get over there and uh (laughs) that was the biggest shock for me i guess Um, well i I am wholly unfamiliar with mongolia so is it is it more hot more arid over there uh no so it's actually a similar climate similar altitude to denver um but it's just far more extreme um so in the winter time it gets to like it's it's uh more like what you'd find in minnesota or like up in Canada, I mean, it's negative 30 regularly in the winter time. And then, you know, really <clears throat> bad wind chill can push it down to like negative 50. Um, so very, very cold in the winter time. And uh, the seasons are shorter, or well, so summer is short, shorter. Uh, it's a be- it's beautiful in the summertime over there. Um, um, yeah, getting out of the city especially was a real treat uh, in the summertime. We would, you know, we could go sw- swim in the river or uh, f- go fishing, camping. Um, they, it, there were, growing up, there really weren't any fences. Like people didn't fence off large um, plots of land. I think uh, all the Mongolian citizens had a certain amount that they were allowed to fence off for a yard um, for, you know, just the house and and a small yard, but you know, people didn't purchase huge plots of land and then fence Mm. it off uh, like they do here. And Mm. so you could kind of go anywhere you wanted um, on or off a road um, and just explore. Uh, The population density is um, once you get outside the city is pretty, it's pretty slim. I mean, you, there's still a lot of nomads in Mongolia, but, um, when you get outside the cities, you know, it very quickly becomes pretty rugged and pretty, pretty wild, uh, which was really fun. So you could get out of the city and, um, yeah, do all sorts of out outdoor adventure type things. Is that some of your, um, fondest memories of being in Mongolia is exploring the, I guess the countryside? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, the school we were part of that my dad directed was an incredible international community um, that was very much, um, yeah, foundational to my childhood. Um, Pretty much all of the families that were there were missionary families. And um, so from all over the world, different... uh, different denominations and viewpoints, but everyone was there for this common purpose. And, uh, yeah, it was really beautiful. So most of my best memories are from, from being at the school and and having activities there. Um, but then getting outside the city, um, some of my other best memories are, uh, fishing trips that I went on with my dad. Uh, Mongolia has some pretty awesome fishing. Um, so yeah, they have a, a tame, uh, it's called a taman and it's the largest, uh, trout in the world. So, I mean, if you just Google a picture of a taman, I think that's spelled T A I M A N, but it's a, uh, it's a monster. It's, uh, I never caught one, but that was always like the, you know, the dream to catch one of those. Is that going to be uh, in one of your future dioramas? Is going to be like a weird yeah. West taman? I should, I should, I should absolutely include include one. You know, like a. I mean, I'd probably exaggerate the size of it, but yeah, <laughs> a legendary <laughs> taman. Yeah, you can finally uh, finally catch the taman that. Uh, That's right. That you'd always wanted to. That's exactly. Cool. So you you had uh, siblings. Yes. Um, Did you get along with everybody? Yeah. Yes. My uh, siblings are among my best friends to this day. 
I have seven of them. You guys had a small army over there. That's cool. <laughs> it was, yeah. And it was funny growing up in, uh, in, in the city in Mongolia, in Ulaanbaatar, um, UB is what they call it for short. Um, we had a, a pretty small apartment. And so we had one room for all the boys, one room for all the girls. And then my parents had a room. And, uh, so we had two, two bunk beds in each room, uh, cause there's four boys and four girls. And so it was, um, you know, consi- considering how many people were actually in that small of a space, uh, it was, it was pretty peaceful actually. Um, it didn't get too chaotic. Um, and we were all, yeah, we all always had stuff to do together. Uh, my brothers and I liked to play video games. Um, we would play outside. We had, uh, p- kids from, from the area. We would, especially my brother, one of my brothers would loved organizing like little, um, game, uh, times outside. So, you know, very much like growing up in a, in a neighborhood with lots of kids in the States, you know, it just looked a little, a little different. Um, you know, we were climbing on, on, um, like packing containers and stuff and, uh, you know, running around. (laughs) Yeah. Just being kids. just being kids in Mongolia and the weirder, the, the, the further away from it, I get the, the, the more just like interesting it actually is, um, to think, wow, my childhood was very different. Um, just in terms of the setting, uh, the things we, we, you know, the, the environment and the things we, um, yeah, it was just, it was just a very different country. Hmm. Do you think, do you think being able to grow up in that environment and just, I mean, genuinely see the other side of the world really helped, I don't know, shape some kind of perspective that a lot of people here in the States don't have? Yeah. Yeah. I would say so. Um, I do think the world is a smaller place than we realize. Um, I think growing up in Mongolia, (coughs) uh, just the the general population over there just doesn't have as much money or space um, or material goods uh, like we do here. And uh, just kind of like some of the contrast of when we would come back to the States and visit and just seeing how much more people had, but how oftentimes there was a lot more discontent Mm. and, and, um, you know, like kids would complain way more, uh, about, you know, not getting the cool new thing and, and not having, um, what their friend had, but over there, like, you, you know, it was just interesting to see how so many people lived with just a lot less and uh but they valued things like family and friendship and uh, a lot more and so there was just a different yeah very different perspective i think it's to me like something i learned um because i as a kid i didn't get to travel and do all that stuff but i i did grow up super poor and um so i didn't have a lot of stuff so i valued things and like for me my bicycle was the center of my universe. Is <laughs> it, you know what I mean? It gave me freedom yeah, in, in for a sure. way that, that nothing else would. And um, I've noticed there's uh, like a, a super disposability to everything nowadays. You know, like nothing hmm. matters, doesn't mean anything. You could just throw it away. And I definitely see it in my kids. And it's like, I, I wish, you know, I wish I could kind of instill something in them. Uh, you know, short of moving them to Mongolia. Yeah. <laughs> right. I just feel like it's something that's very much lost on a lot of people. And um, you say the, <coughs> the world is small, but some people's world is, I mean, it's the size of a, a room here. It seems like they just, they don't, I don't know, they just don't have much perspective. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel that. Makes me a little sad. But also, I'm sure you've saw, you know, people 
live with a lot less, but I'm sure there was just a lot of joy and happiness and, and love as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There, there was, um, I mean, it, it's all the same, same struggles in a lot, a lot of ways. It always looks a little different, but the same, same similar struggles, uh, over there, um, they just all look a, a little different. And, and, and I mean, that's, that's true of, of many different cultures that I've been able to experience, you know, um, in, for instance, in Thailand, where my, where my parents are now, um, everything's a little bit more subtle, you know, like you don't, you, everything's kind of masked with a smile. Hmm. Um, but so everything's, to, you know, internalized, um, uh, in Mongolia, everything is, you know, externalized. So, so like, you know, if, if you're frustrated, like you just show it, um, uh, you know, you just, you know, it, it's just, it is interesting to see how, um, pretty much the whole world struggles with all of the same things. Uh, and it's just culturally everyone processes it a little different. That is interesting. Do you feel like you, uh, absorb some of those traits and you still have those? Do you still externalize a lot of your emotions? <laughs> I have never been one to uh, be all that uh, expressive. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I, yeah, Mongolia was not, um, yeah, didn't rub off on me in that in that way. <laughs> gotcha. It was foreign in, in multiple senses of the word. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. All right. Well, you said your dad was, was teaching the school over there. Um, and mm -hmm. then you turned 18 after you graduated, you came back to the States. What, um, what drove you to come back? Like, why not stay over there and, you know, continue the, the work? Like, did you feel pressure? Like you need to be in the family business sort of thing, or were you, you know, kind of allowed to strike your own path? So my parents were missionaries and they were sent out by a church here in, uh, Colorado. And so, um, it's one that my family's been attending for a very long time. And, uh, so was able to come back and have some, some form of, uh, yeah, community and something that had been a stable thing throughout my, uh, life. Every time we came back, that's where we went. And so, um, yeah, coming back to Colorado felt natural. Um, even if it was hard, I didn't necessarily feel all that home in the United States. Um, things, I had a lot more culture shock coming back, hmm. um, which is interesting, but I, I think a lot of, uh, third culture kids, um, which is like, if you're not familiar with the term, um, kids who are, you know, missionary kids or military kids, kids who grow up in, in a different context who don't feel quite, uh, like they're from either culture that, you know, the one that they went from originally or the one that they grew up in, but they're kind of this third culture. Um, and so a lot of third culture kids feel that way when they return to their uh, country of origin. That's interesting. Do you still feel like uh, a third culture kid even today? Uh, you know what? No, uh, I think I have acclimated pretty well. I, I mean, I, I still hold on to a lot of the things that I learned and grew up with uh, in my childhood. There's just a lot of lessons that I, I definitely hold on to. But uh, I, I do very much like living in Colorado and America. One of the things I came back here and really decided to um, kind of invest in mentally was uh, learning to appreciate this country. Um, and learning to appreciate even in, even in the ways that it was lacking, just appreciate, um, what was going on here. And, uh, there are a lot of things that, uh, we have access to in the United States that are, um, uh, taken for granted. And I really did want to be able to appreciate a lot of those things, those, uh, yeah, liberties and, um. I mean, just the, also just the country itself, the, the, the landscape, um, you know, I have been able to, <clears throat> I've been able to 
do uh, quite a bit of exploring here in the state of Colorado and then also through the Southwest and uh, been on a few road trips here and there and uh, see quite a bit of the country. And it, you, the United States, it, from, a, from a geography perspective, is pretty incredible. Um, it's, it's, that was one of the things that I really did want to do is come back and be able to appreciate and learn to appreciate what, uh, um, yeah, why, what is great? What is good about the United States? What is, what are the things here that, uh, are, um, shouldn't be taken for granted? And, um, yeah, the ability to drive around and explore and, um, I don't know. There's just a, I have a deeper appreciation for the United States uh, um, than I did when I was growing up. Cause it always felt, I don't know, I would always come back and we'd kind of just mostly be in, in um, suburbia. Um, and then, you know, I, I would always compare that to some of the more adventurous stuff that I was doing over in Mongolia. Mm. Um, so um, yeah, coming back and, Getting outside of uh, the bubble <laughs> was uh, something I did and and found value in. Hmm, that's cool. So, what are your? Yeah, you said you've driven around, obviously Colorado, and uh, you sound like you probably are still an outdoorsy guy, like to hike and stuff like that in Southwest. What um, have any of those places surprised you? And do you? I mean, do you want to just kind of like hit all 50 states? Like you being, you, you sound like a person who yeah. <laughs> makes a lot of decisions with intention. You put a lot of thought and energy into what you decide to do. Yeah, I, I would love to, to, um, visit all 50 states eventually. Um, some of them, some of the ones that, uh, some of the places that absolutely just, <clears throat> were shocking to me in, in, in just their scale and the, how impressive they were. Um, Yellowstone is, is unbelievable. I, I, um, I love the wildlife that's represented there and the geothermal activity is really inspiring. Um, uh, it's just a beautiful wild place that, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. Um, another one that I had seen, obviously tons of pictures of, but hadn't been to, uh, was the Grand Canyon. And, uh, the first time I went there and it was actually during a blizzard. And <laughs> so we showed up to the edge and it was complete whiteout condition. So we just couldn't see anything uh, at the first viewpoint. And so I was like, oh man, are we going to be here? And <laughs> I'm just going to see snow. Um, <laughs> So we drove to the next one, still nothing, drove to the next one, a little bit clearer so we could see down into the, um, into the canyon just a little bit. And then on, on the next one, um, and this really did show the scale of the Grand Canyon, but like the, the wind had blown. And so we drove around part of the storm and could see actually now into the canyon. And I mean, it was, it was breathtaking, um, because all of the horizontal surfaces down to a certain spot were, were, um, had been frosted with snow. And so the contrast between the, the rocks and the snow, I mean, it was, it was, it was really incredible, um, and would be a difficult experience to, to recreate, uh, was that first, first sight of the Grand Canyon. Um, yeah, that was pretty incredible. And, and then, it sounds like uh, a, a unique view that I, I've never heard anybody else describe. I've never heard anybody else. Everybody I've also, uh, ever talked to about the Grand Canyon has been there kind of during the summer and described, you know, like the colors and uh, obviously <laughs> yeah. talked about the size, but I've never heard anybody. So it sounds like you may even have something of a unique perspective on it. Yeah, I, I think I do. I, I think that was a, it was quite a unique um, experience at the Grand Canyon. Um, Yosemite. Another one that, <coughs> I mean, it just, it feels, it feels almost like a fairy tale. Like when you walk, when you, when you drive in, 
Uh, I didn't go through the main entrance where you see like the grand view or um, like when you come out of the tunnel, I think it's called inspiration uh, point. Uh, but I, we approached from a different part uh, of the park. And so when we drove in, we were more uh, on the ground level and uh, the river is running by you. And then you, it, you like come around this bend and you open up to this, um, the meadow and you're surrounded by these massive cliffs and waterfalls and there's like a deer standing there and i mean it was just so serene and i mean it, it was it was seriously like um like driving into a fairy tale uh just that was that was so inspiring to me um yeah that was a good one i think the the california coast like big sir um and then all the way up to, um, there's a really cool spot called Point Reyes that I visited. And uh, you can just see this stretch of beach that's just unbelievable. Uh, and it's actually, there's a there's a lighthouse there that's um, had the highest wind speeds, in, uh, I believe, on the Pacific coast of, Amer of uh, the United States, at least. Um, but it's uh, just north of San Francisco. And that is another one that was just really beautiful view. I mean, um, combined with partial visibility because of the fog and then when it would clear up and you could see a little bit further and a little bit further, uh, was, was just a really, really inspiring sight. And then, uh, one more place that, uh, was just really inspiring to me and actually was the kind of the birthplace of the wild imaginary West series was, um, the black Canyon of the Gunnison in um near near uh it's basically between gunnison and montrose in south western colorado and uh it there's a little town um and it was well it's it's now there's only a couple portions of buildings left but um in the bottom of the canyon on the far end there's a little ghost town called east portal and uh during there was a so they <coughs> drilled a tunnel from the river through the canyon wall and then it went all the way out to get water um to montrose and um this little town only existed for a short amount of time um while they were digging the tunnel but it's one of these it's one of the features of the park and so my wife and i drove down to there and we saw this picture of it in it kind of its uh in its glory day <laughs> and uh it was just really really inspiring it's this little town in the bottom of a 2000 foot canyon and it looks like it's just a classic wild west town um you know they had like a little chapel they had a little bar you know, or saloon they had like you know, all the you know places where the people uh stayed all the bunk houses and stuff but it was just like it was so inspiring to think like, wow, what a weird setting for a wild Western town. And, uh, I was like, what if, what if East portal was more than just like, just a, a little town where they were digging a tunnel, you know, it was the, the Eastern side of this tunnel. What if there was more to it than that? <laughs> and what if there were hiding secrets down here and what if there were monsters? And so I just kind of went down that, um, that was the kind of the creative, uh, rabbit hole, I guess. But it started with um, this little town of East Portal in um, in the Black Canyon of the Gunnison. Mm. So you you get there, you see the few buildings, you look at the picture. Did it make you feel a certain way to be in that environment, or do you think it just really kind of tapped into some some creativity and you started kind of working around uh, there? Because I I know some places I go to. I'll have a feeling first, like they just make me feel a specific way, you know, sometimes mm. unexpected and then things will sort of lead from there. Yeah, no, absolutely. I know what you, that is what I felt. It was, a, it was, it was very like distinctly, like I felt a way <laughs> I was like, huh, what a, you know, like, I mean, just being in the bottom of this Canyon and seeing this picture and then like seeing where the picture was taken, obviously the buildings, most of them aren't there anymore. But like, yeah, 
I, I very much like uh, imagination was transported to uh, to something else. Yeah, it sounds like you found yourself in like this secret little world that yeah, al yeah. almost is unbelievable that it existed. Maybe like uh, the lost city of Atlantis or something. Atlantis. Right. That's so right. cool. Yeah. That's very cool. Because like I've had a couple of those experiences, but they're few and far between. And I distinctly remember them. Like I remember hmm. that feeling. That's so cool. <coughs> but yeah, like the the Weird West. I, I call it Weird West. Like my, my 17 year old calls it Weird West. Kind of that style yeah. of, of uh, you know, Old West mixed with fantastic monsters or contraptions like that that couldn't exist or whatever um, right uh it's he's i'm not sure 100 percent why he's attracted to the aesthetic we play uh this like role-playing game called um deadlands that's sort of set huh. in the weird west and it's you know it's kind of like dungeons and dragons but it's sort of a weird west mechanic and, right uh, it's so funny because i had been watching you for probably a year and a half and then I walked by him one time and I, I heard your voice. And I was like, oh, you're watching Boy Light Hobby Time. He's like, what? It's like, yeah, dude. So funny. <laughs> he found you from a completely different avenue. I mean, we're both nerds, obviously, but uh, that's great. So funny that we kind of sort of connected on that one spot as well. I that was so cool. But yeah, I, uh, I didn't find you from the Star Wars stuff, but I'm willing to bet a bunch of the Star Wars people that find you stick around, you know, just for the style and uh, not just kind of the aesthetic of your stuff. It's extremely polished. Uh, you've been very polished for a really long time. Like, is that, did you just teach yourself all that stuff or is that some of the stuff you did in college? Uh, no, uh, that, so before starting the YouTube channel, I had really not done anything with um, video. Um, That's crazy. Once I once I started, I mean, I, I recorded my first video, and if you go back and watch it, it's pretty choppy. My voiceover is not that. Uh, I mean, the audio is terrible. But uh, one of the things, once I started doing it more, I was like, I should really pay more attention to the editing style of this, and 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 to how to like, I should learn. I really should learn um, how to make this more polished, uh, like you said. And so I watched a ton of tutorials. I, um, I, one of the things that I wanted to do was kind of emulate an editing style, uh, at least in terms of like the pacing and the cuts that I saw from my, some of my favorite YouTubers. And so I, um, I wanted the, you know, like, uh, in some ways the, the music and the the pacing to look more like what you'd see from a vlog, like a, a Casey Neistat kind of thing. I wanted, you know, like I didn't want this to be a tutorial crafting video. I wanted it to be more entertaining and like something that anybody could watch and whether they were going to ever sit down and build their own thing um, or not, I wanted it to be entertaining uh, for them. And so uh, that's kind of the shift that I really uh, made. I was I was thinking, should I make more tutorial? Should I make more inspiration? And uh, I kind of just leaned into the inspiration side. Um, so I do. I I'll give little tips and tricks here and there, and I'll I'll outline things. But um, I don't really consider myself a very good teacher. I don't know how to necessarily <laughs> break down in a really easy to understand way how to do any of these techniques. And, and, and frankly, most of them have been learned from here, like all over the place. And I'll try and, I, I try and give credit, um, when I remember where I learned something. Um, but, uh, you know, I, if people write to me and say, Hey, how did you, how do you do this thing? I usually just respond with a tutorial of, that I, of somebody else's YouTube video that I, appreciate and that really helped me um yeah yeah that's cool and i noticed uh, you do you kind of regularly shout out like i got this from you know uh craftsman or you know i i saw this on uh craftastrophe or you know something like that right. and uh, uh i think it's pretty cool how like that small community because you guys really are it's a very small community that you all kind of live in 
how you guys uh, shout each other out, kind of lift each other up. Uh, it's pretty cool. <laughs> does it um, does it feel pretty awesome when you uh, like you like you've made it when one of those other guys like starts shouting you out? Like oh, <laughs> I've earned my I've, I've joined the gang. I've earned my patch. Uh, yeah, and it is pretty fun. Um, luckily, I mean at this point, most of them at least from the more crafting side, not necessarily as much on the war gaming side, but in the, in the crafting YouTube world, um, I'm friends with, with, uh, many of them. And, uh, I was invited to join a, a collaboration, which was the, was really, it, it felt really nice, like to be invited to, um, we did a, they, they only invited me cause I was into star Wars and crafting. Uh, and it was the uh, May 4th um, pod racer build. Um, oh, yeah, that was a really fun one. It was, it was a really fun thing to be a part of. And, you know, Bill making stuff does not like Star Wars. Um, <laughs> and so he was begrudgingly a part of it. And then when they were going to invite me, who I have done a lot of Star Wars content, he's like, ugh, like a Star Wars craft YouTuber. Like, he definitely... Yeah, it was funny. I, I, now we're buddies, but I think at the very beginning he was kind of like, oh, I don't know if <laughs> this dude's super into Star Wars. I don't know if I want him <laughs> to be a part of this. I mean, I, I think we all know the kind of Star Wars guy you're talking about, and uh, yeah. small doses. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I no, I feel it. that. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> Yeah, but it is great. I mean, they're 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 such fun, fun, fun guys. And um, actually, coming up at a certain point here, we're going to be going to um, like Bill making stuff is flying across the ocean, and uh, we're going to have a little meetup uh, with a few of us. I think we might might try and do some kind of a crafting video in person, um, which is funny because I I mean I think. Most of us don't show our faces, so maybe it'll just be Bill and a bunch of blurred out faces. It'll be Bill and there's just a whole bunch of extra hands. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, like uh, talking about Craftsman, like he's worn gloves, I think, from video one. So it's like, yeah, like no part of his skin has ever been visible. So you've you've at least um, braved from elbow <laughs> That's down. That's right. So you're doing good. Yeah, that is true. A little bit more of me has been visible. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. That's cool, man. Like, I, did, I, I was just thinking, like you saying out loud, it's probably surreal saying that you're part of the YouTube crafts community. That's such a, an odd sentence to put together. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. A weird series of words to, to craft together. And like you try to describe to somebody like, uh, like what you do. It's like, yeah, I, uh, do crafting videos on the internet. <laughs> but I, I assume guys who like stream on Twitch probably feel the same way when they're explaining to people, right? Yeah, I'm sure. No, it is very funny. It is, And I mean, I think, <laughs> I think we're all pretty self-aware that, you know, we're, we're making crafting content on the internet. You know, don't get it twisted. We're not, we're not, um, <laughs> I don't know. We're not athletes or rock stars. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I um, you you maybe maybe you're a genius because I've heard somebody one time they were describing um, athletes, Olympic athletes, and they were saying that they were geniuses. And like I had always prescribed that term to people who were like you know like math wizards or like building rockets or something. But they were basically saying if you are like elite level expert in your field, right? And and maybe if you're an Olympic athlete, it's controlling your body to do something, you know, and and hmm. punishing yourself to, you know, over and over and over until you get amazing at it, right? Like perhaps you're a, a genius at YouTube crafting, you know? <laughs> well, I don't I don't know about that. I mean, I think there's a, a certainly an element of luck. Um and I mean, I mean, I think I think a lot more people could could create uh, successful crafting channels. Um, I think it just takes. I don't know if everybody wants to invest the time that it does take to. I mean, it it really has 
um, absorbed most of my, <laughs> most if not all of my free time um, on top of my other job. So I, I think if more people were more um, were willing to, to put in the time, I think a lot more people could actually do it if they, if they wanted to. Hmm. So you started the video or started the YouTube series to keep you accountable. Has it sort of, and I know for me, a lot of this stuff is cyclical. Like sometimes I'll be burned out and then sometimes it will build me up and kind of enrich me. Right. Like, does it, does hmm. it still feed you creatively in that way? Or is it kind of a grind or is it like everything else cyclical? Yeah, it, it's cyclical. I mean, I think it is, there are definitely times when it's hard to come up with ideas. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, it'll, it'll have been a really long <laughs> week of work <coughs> and, uh, I put out a video and it may not perform as well. And I'm just like, man, I just want to take, I want to take a week off and, um, <laughs> You know, it definitely catches up to me at moments, but um, those are few and far between. Uh, for the most part, I've it's been a real blessing to um, be able to be creatively inspired. Um, and and as I make more stuff, as I you know expand the wild western universe uh, that I'm making, and as new you know, movies or trailers come out and I find inspiration in those things. Um, for the most part, I have just been, um, creatively enriched and creatively inspired through this process. And, uh, it really does. I mean, there, there is an element of like, now I, I am, you know, I, I am obligated to put out a video, um, cause it is what I have, um, gotten, my viewership to expect and um you know there's an element of feeling obligate obligation to that but at the same time it's also it is a really fun thing to do it's a fun thing to um to have a group of people that want to see what's going to happen next and uh you know i like to surprise people um you know when I did, I did recently, I did an RRR diorama, um, which is a, an Indian, Indian movie. And, um, you know, like I, I don't think a sing I don't think a single person, uh, was expecting that next, you know? Um, uh, and so it was fun to be able to put something out that, you know, was going to reach a different crowd of people, um, was going to introduce a bunch of other people to a movie that I really enjoyed. Um, and so, yeah, for the most part, this whole YouTube process and um, becoming um, or getting more subscribers and, and, and kind of moving more into it as a job and less of a hobby um, has been really encouraging. And uh, by there's been some obviously discouraging moments, but by and large, it's been a really, really fun experience. That's really cool. You know, something else that just struck me is uh, earlier you were talking about only 15,000 people in Denver. And I think that is an amazing amount of people. That's humans, right? And so if you think about it, you as a an artist putting out your art, right? I think most artists create art so people enjoy it. And you get, I mean, feedback that a huge number of people are enjoying your art. A lot of the artists I talk to largely oil and anonymity you know it's kind of it's kind of quiet maybe they'll they'll have mm. a little gallery right or they'll go to art shows and stuff and you know they'll get a little bit of feedback there um but i think it's um i don't know if it's increasingly rare or just as rare but a lot of artists don't um don't get to realize how much people enjoy their work while they're still alive you know so i think that's mm. that's pretty cool do you ever kind of ponder on that like that's pretty dope like you said it uh, at 18, you knew you wanted to go to college and do some art stuff. And now I mean, you have tens of thousands of people on a weekly basis, literally enjoying your mm -hmm. art, enjoying the, the fruits of your labor. I think that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I do think about that. I think about that, um, 
I mean, it is, it is crazy to me that, um, one of the things I think about pretty often is if I was just making these in the, um, (laughs) in the solitude of my workshop and then taking it somewhere and trying to sell it, it would be very difficult, if not impossible to make a living off of it based on, on the time it takes and how much I could charge for it. Um, you know, cause it's a very niche form of art. And, yeah. um, so just the idea of being able to monetize the process and kind of move outside of the, of the workshop in my voiceover and and turn the process of making this art into a social thing that I am, I'm like a lot, I'm, I'm letting other people enter into and enjoy. And in in some sense, as I'm sitting there thinking through what I'm going to say, and as I'm going through the process and as things are happening, you know, that I'm dealing with (coughs) on this project, um, it's, it's really cool to, to see kind of, to kind of make this artistic process, um, accessible. And, um, it's, it's something that, um, I would love to be able to help more people do. Um, I think there are tons of excellent artists out there who if they were to be able to monetize the process of the art itself and not just the final product, I mean, I think they would enjoy the creation of their art more. They wouldn't feel as isolated. And, um, I, it's certainly been the case for me and, uh, yeah, I would love to somehow, however that looks, help other artists, Uh, be able to do that because if you can if you can gain a following making something as niche as star wars dioramas and you know fantasy wild west you know dioramas and actually make a living from it i mean there are certainly plenty of artists out there who are creating excellent things who could do the same Mm, that is such a beautiful sentiment so i i got some asterisks on here and i i call that whenever somebody says something that really like inspires me i'll write it down i'll put an asterisk by it he said uh monetize the process not just the art and i Hmm. think that's that you know because it's so funny like as you've been talking like i've had flashes of some of the other artists i've talked to that do struggle and part of the most fascinating part for me obviously i ask people how they got to where they are i love the process um you know there's Hmm. like uh i've talked to chalk artists and it's such a beautiful ephemeral thing and the process is amazing to watch happen right but <laughs> right you never see anybody like like film that and put that although i've never looked on youtube for chalk artists you just kind of came up in my feed one day and you know i went from there but hmm. yeah like that's and just also the idea that not so isolated and also maybe um be able to to speak i was just thinking too like somebody like you who's somewhat shy and you know, maybe doesn't want to put their face on camera. They can have their art there and, and still convey a message and a feeling. I think that's a beautiful thing. Right. Hmm. That's cool. Well, Caleb, I think I've made you uh, stretch your strained voice long enough and I have consumed <laughs> far too much of your time. I, I truly appreciate the gift of your time that you've given me. Um, so right here at the end, I like to say, well, first I'm going to say, um, you know, uh, if you want to support Caleb, you should go to patreon.com forward slash boy And that's capital B O Y L E I. Most people I talk to with Patreons are so bad about promoting that. So I'll go ahead and do it. And there'll also be a link <laughs> in the description and all of the posts as well. So jump in there and help this, uh, help this kid, um, keep making art and, uh, you know, uh, give, uh, give yourself a way to connect with him. It worked for me. He was dumb enough to answer my email. So <laughs> there you go. Um, but if you want people to 
interact with you you know i'm obviously i'm pretty sure you're going to push your youtube channel and other things how would you have them do it yeah uh i mean i guess just uh watching is uh and watching and leaving comments is uh yeah i i try to read as many of the comments as possible and it's always just it's fun to see that people people watch and um enjoy and pick out things in the in the videos that they like and uh let me know uh yeah all right i know you've got other socials like instagram and such are you are you a big fan of those because I, I know you you put like kind of screenshots and uh of finished yeah. builds and stuff are you as big a fan of that um you know you honestly the the i have all of those um i don't i'm not very active on those so um, yeah, I'm, I'm on Instagram, uh, as well. Uh, but it's, it's kind of just a, I did mostly just post the thumb, thumbnail, uh, of the finished build. So YouTube's probably the main, the main thing. Right. Yeah. It's more cause you have to do the other things, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. I'm not a big fan. Either. Anyway, uh, Caleb, again, thank you so much for your time. I, uh, appreciate everything you do. Um, I like your style. I like your food choices. I think you're a cool guy. <laughs> and uh, oh, one last one last thing. What's with the fish? Why is why is that your your avatar? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, that is a fun funny little finishing story here. Um, I originally was when contemplating making a YouTube channel. One of the things that I was thinking of doing was, uh, making a, um, kind of a fun, uh, aquarium building <coughs> YouTube channel. Uh, I was, I know I, I got really into saltwater aquariums, at least watching on online and, and looking into fish. And I, I just thought they're incredible. I've always loved aquariums. Um, and so I was thinking of doing that and then um, I, I looked into how much it actually costs, uh, to have a, a nice saltwater aquarium and the time that it is required. And it was uh prohibitive, prohibitive, prohibit, prohibitive, um, to me and my current uh, life circumstances. And so instead I got this little app on my phone. It was a little game and I, I built a little aquarium which, you know, when it's on the phone, it's a little different. Uh, but you still get to, you know, collect the fish and learn their names and, you know, build a little habitat for them to swim around in. And um, one of the fish that I really enjoyed um, was this little peppermint angel fish. I thought it had a really nice uh, kind of chill demeanor. It kind of looked like, you know, in a sense, it kind of looks like a little um, maybe slightly unaware but like generally <laughs> optimistic fish. <laughs> so I don't know. I just connected with it. And then when I started my YouTube channel, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. I might, cause I, <laughs> I started the YouTube channel before actually knowing what I was going to do. But, um, I was like, maybe I'll do fish. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe I'll do fish eventually. And, mm -hmm. uh, so, but then I was also like, maybe I'll do crafting. And I was like, I want something that's kind of unrelated um, I didn't want to do something that was, you know, Star Wars-y. I didn't want to do something that was craft necessarily. I mean, I, I do have hobby time in there, but still kind of ambiguous. And then Boili uh, is the Latin name for the peppermint angelfish. It's the Centropage Boili. And that is the name of the channel. It's also the name of the fish. It was meant to be. Yep. Kismet. All right. Well, great note to go out on. I'm going to hit stop on all this stuff. All right.